Okay, the handout for today, what I did was I added the first, I added this uh, religion's righteousness is the name of it, and the first, I guess, six points here, the first six sentences I added. The last five sentences are the same ones that were in last week's that we didn't cover. So, um, all I did was I took last week's outline and then, then I added those first six here. As I think it's last week we covered about how salvation is by faith alone, without works. And I think it's important that we recognize that what religion does, they've got their own righteousness, which is not the righteousness of God. And so we'll cover that first and then we'll finish up what we had on the outline from last week. Uh, the first point, if you go over to Acts chapter 22, we're going to look at Paul because he was a Pharisee and he was a very good Pharisee. He did what he was supposed to do according to that law. And so um, we're going to see that at first. I'm going to look at Acts 22 and also Acts 26. These are um, two accounts when Paul's conversion is in Acts chapter 9 and then we're given it again in Acts 22 and also in Acts 26. So it's given three different times. A little different details are given each time. Uh, the fact that it's in your Bible three times tells you it's a pretty important event, and it was because it started the dispensation of grace. Uh, so it's in there three times. I notice in Acts 22, starting in verse 3, Paul is speaking, he's defending himself. He says there in Acts 22, 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. So this gives you a little bit of Paul's background before his Acts 9 conversion. He was a Jew brought up under Gamaliel. Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5 is mentioned as a Pharisee who is a doctor of the law. So you could think of him as a PhD from a seminary school, sort of like that uh, here. He has a, he's a doctor of the law. He's a Pharisee. And Paul was brought up that way. And then in Acts 26 and verse 5, Paul specifically identifies himself as being brought up as a Pharisee. In, cha in chapter 26, verse 4, he talks about his manner of life from his youth. And then in verse 5, he says, Which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So, a sect, you could think of it today, if you want to put it in today's terms, you could think of Christianity and all the different denominations that are within it. You know, Catholics, Baptists, Lutherans, Episcopal, Congregational, all those different types. Um, same thing here. And so your first fill in the blank is that Paul was a Pharisee, the strictest denomination of the Jewish religion. So you, you think of it today, you could think of the different denominations within the Christian religion and some are more strict than others. And the, in Paul's day, among the Jewish religion, the Pharisees were the strictest of all the sects or the different denominations that were out there. So in other words, if it, the point is, is that if you were to follow the Jewish religion, and if you followed the Pharisees, what they said, uh, you were following the most strict. You were following the, I guess, the highest one, if you would say. In other words, if righteousness could come by the law, then being a Pharisee would be the way to go because it was the strictest, it was the hardest. And uh, if we go over to Philippians chapter 3, we see that Paul was a very good Pharisee. He wasn't one that just attended on Saturdays and the Sabbath and then uh, did whatever he wanted the rest of the week. He was brought up under a, a doctor of law, went to his Jewish religious school, so to speak, brought up at his feet. He continued in that, was very zealous in it. And in Philippians chapter 3, and verse, starting in verse 5, 
we can see him again talking about his previous life before Christ came to him on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He says there in Philippians 3 verse 5 that he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So your next fill in the blank there is that Paul was blameless under religion. And uh, a lot of times if you hear this verse, Philippians 3, 6, it doesn't say he was righteous under religion. It says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And a lot of people will teach this and they'll say, well, he followed the Mosaic law and he's not perfect. It doesn't say he's perfect, he's blameless. So meaning that if he committed a sin, then he would bring the sacrifices required under the Mosaic law and there would be no blame found in him even though he sinned. That's what most people say. But I would contend that this righteousness which is in the law is not a reference to the Mosaic law. It's a reference to the Jewish religion. And the reason I say that is because we just read in Acts 22 that he, or we even see it here, that he persecuted the church. We read in Acts 22 that he even bound them and delivered them uh, to their death. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was stoned, he was martyred there, we're told at the end of that that they laid the clothes of, um, of them at Saul's feet and that Saul was consenting unto his death. So Saul was sort of in charge in that. Saul was really under the Mosaic law. He was guilty of murder. He had murdered people by, by um, arresting them and prosecuting them and then being killed for being believers. They weren't following the Jewish... I mean, they were following believing Jesus was the Messiah and believing the gospel of the kingdom and he went out and persecuted and sentenced them to death. Well, according to the Mosaic law, those people had not done anything wrong. They were just following what God had said. They didn't go against what God said. Rather, they went against the Jewish religion. Well, if you, if you kill an innocent man, according to the Mosaic law, then you should be killed yourself. There is no animal sacrifice that you can bring to cover for your sin. Uh, if not for the mercy of God, you, you would be killed. So really, when it came down to the, the Mosaic law, even if he sinned against that and brought sacrifices, um, he was not blameless according to the Mosaic law because he was <coughs> persecuting and killing Christians, basically. Those who had believed in the gospel of the kingdom. So he is only blameless under the Jewish religion. And so that's why I say that he was blameless under religion, not under the, not under the Mosaic law. So that law there would be a reference to the Pharisees' law, their religion, which differed from the Mosaic law. I mean, they, they followed things in it, but they didn't follow it completely. They ended up, they would tie their mint and spices and give that according to the law, but then the justice and mercy part, they didn't do. They ended up, when Jesus was um, arrested and then sentenced to death, they were careful not to enter the judgment hall lest they defile themselves and couldn't eat the Passover, so they kept that, but then they're guilty of killing their Messiah. They killed him with wicked hands. They have crucified and slain him, according to Acts chapter 2. So. Uh, the Pharisees, the, the point is, is just because the Pharisees said something, they were the strictest sect of the Jewish religion, they did not necessarily follow the Mosaic Law. They had taken the law and they had changed it uh, for their own purposes, for their own gain. And so if you go over to Matthew chapter 5, you can see that that righteousness which is under the law is not enough to come into the kingdom of heaven because what they've done is they've taken the law. If you look in Matthew 5, in verse 21 all the way down through uh, the end of the chapter through verse 48 Jesus shows the people there how the Pharisees law differs from the Mosaic law how they taken it and made it to you know, the Mosaic law basically it wasn't just physically killing someone to break the commandment of thou shalt not kill but you could actually have hatred in your brother's heart in your heart toward your brother and then you have killed him as far as breaking the Mosaic Law is concerned, even though you haven't physically done it. Same thing with adultery. If you lust after a woman 
it's not your wife, then you've committed adultery, even though you physically haven't committed the act. That's, but the Pharisees, though, defined it more toward the physical so that they could say that they were not guilty under the Mosaic law. And the result there in Matthew 5, verse 20, Jesus says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I put on your outline that Paul was blameless under religion, under that Pharisee's rule, but we find out that religion shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here are the Pharisees. They were, if you wanted to look for the most righteous of all the Jewish denominations, that's the Pharisees. We saw they were the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. And they did some good things. They followed the law in part. But the problem is, is they, just like all of us, they all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, they all broke the law. And so if they were trusting in their own righteousness that was found in that religion, Jesus says they shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The problem with religion, if we go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, is that if you are following your own, in this case, your own Jewish traditions and trusting in them to have eternal life rather than in God's provision under the law covenant through the death of Jesus Christ who would bring about the atonement for sins. If you're trusting in what you do, then you yourself have become God. You say that, you know, I'm good enough. I don't need the death of Jesus to atone for my sins. I've done the good works. I've obeyed the law. That's what the rich young ruler, the rich young man said over in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 17, when he comes to Christ and he says, all these things in the law I've done. Well, he was righteous in his own eyes, saying that I can make it into the kingdom myself because I have done everything that the law says I should do. And when in fact, he is guilty under the law just like everybody else. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 12, Paul, again, talking about his previous life before he was converted, he says there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So you see, Paul was blameless according to the Jewish religion, but his righteousness, he didn't have any, he didn't have the righteousness of God. He couldn't have eternal life through what he did because first off, he blasphemed God. That's your next uh, point on your outline is that religion blasphemes God. The way you blaspheme someone is you take on their name and you degrade it. God is holy. His name is is holy it's uh, but then if you then claim that you are representing God and you are not meeting that holy standard then you are blaspheming God and that's what he did he claimed as a Pharisee to be righteous he was righteous in his own eyes and he claimed God because he quotes scripture and things to back it up but in declaring that he was righteous through his own religion he was blaspheming God because his religion did not make him righteous. Um, he blasphemed God. Then the verse goes on, he talks about a, a persecutor. So he's persecuting those who do have faith in what God has told them. And then he's injurious. He's injuring or hurting people from being able to uh, have trust in God and his law covenant. And that's what religion does. Religion, so you've got... You've got, like E.C. says, we take the Bible as our final authority, and if we make mistakes or if we're wrong, it's not, we don't change the Bible to agree with what we say. We just believe the Bible is right, and then we uh, admit that we're wrong in that case if it goes against the Bible. But what religion does is it takes, religion takes what man thinks is good, and then it changes the Bible to fit what man says. So it takes on the name of God, it claims to follow what the Bible says, but in fact, because it doesn't, it blasphemes or makes God look bad. Just like the Pharisees, the strictest sect of the Jewish religion, what do they do? They end up killing by wicked hands, crucifying and slaying their Messiah. So religion looks good on the outside, but 
the result was getting rid of the one who came to save them because they wanted to keep their religion. They wanted to keep that going. And then it persecutes people, those who do believe in God, have faith in that. Uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians that you can do nothing for the truth. I'm sorry, you can, only, you can do nothing against the truth, only for the truth. And so when you're faced with the truth of God's word, uh, there is no defense or no answer to that. So the way they try to get around that is to snuff it out, get rid of it. So they persecute those who believe it. And then you've got the other group of people who are following religion and they are injured in being able to learn the gospel and be saved. Uh, just like it is today, it's the same thing. The Christian religion ends up taking on God's name, but yet taking scripture out of context, blaspheming God. Then the, those who believe are persecuted or ostracized from their religion. And then those who are in the religion are injured from being able to learn the truth of the gospel. Uh, so religion ends up blaspheming God. The next point is that it cannot escape hell. That's what Matthew 23 says. And then if we'll go over to Isaiah 64. This passage talks about what religion's righteousness is uh, as far as God's view of it. The righteousness of God under Israel's program We've been studying the book of Revelation in the first hour. Well, when we get to it over there in Revelation 19, we'll see that the, the saints, the believers, who come to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and they end up being clothed with white robes, and that fine linen is called the righteousness of God. They're the ones who trusted in God's law covenant to save them, and then they are clothed with this fine linen, this white, righteous, this white righteousness of God. In contrast, religion according to what we're going to see here in Isaiah 64, is considered to be filthy rags. Uh, verse 5, Isaiah 64, <laughs> verse 5 says, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Um, the context here, a lot of times I think people look at that and they think of, you know, before we're saved, we're lost and bound for hell, and we're filthy sinners, and then God cleans us up, and we're, we're saved, and we get God's righteousness. And that's true, but the focus here isn't really on unbelievers who go to the bars and get drunk every Saturday night and are addicted to illegal drugs and, you know, all this, things that we think of real evil people. The context is religion. Um, you know, at chapter 64 and verse, verse 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, besides thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Then in verse 5, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Uh, so you see there, those are the people there that are trying to be righteous, um, you know, working righteousness here, their own righteousness there. And it says, uh, Behold, thou art wroth. Well, the reason God is wroth against those working their own, their own righteousness is that we are not righteous on our own. It is as as filthy rags. Uh, the result is, even in their righteousness, their own religion, it says, we have sinned. It says, in those is continuance. In other words, if you continue in this religious system, the Jewish religious system in this context, is that you will just continue in sin. Um, you know, as Jesus showed when he showed him the law, that thou shalt not kill refers not only to the physical act, but the act in your mind. And by that standard, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So since we've all sinned, we, our righteousness is as filthy rags, and we will just do nothing but continue in it, it says. Uh, but the thing is that we shall be saved if we instead place our faith in what God has said. And you notice uh, the it says in verse 6, We are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And it really takes God coming 
to deliver them. You see in verse 1, the call that, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. So Israel is in this status that all of us are in, in that we were born into sin, we continue to sin, and we deserve the lake of fire. And the call there is for those who have trusted in God's law covenant with them, then, then they are going to be saved from their own righteousness as filthy rags. They'll be clothed with the fine linen, the white robes of righteousness, when Jesus comes down, His second coming, when He comes and rends the heavens um, and comes and delivers them from that. Uh, but Israel is steeped in their religion here, and um, the result of that religion there is as filthy rags. So that's why if we go back to Philippians chapter 3 now, what we read earlier about what Paul says, how he was blameless under the law, we see how he completely discards that. And that's really a call for us today as well, is that we are saved by faith alone, and the problem is religion comes up and it tries to add things to it, to our salvation, that we have to do things. And we'll go over that probably in the next couple of weeks, things like inviting Jesus to come into your heart, or uh, turning from your sins, and then after that, they'll say you're saved. Well, those are works that you have to do. That's what religion comes in and says, well, Jesus Christ, yeah, He died on the cross to save us from our sins, but, you know, we got to do our part. We've got to turn from our sins. We've got to repent. We've got to come to uh, God and serve Him after we've trusted in the blood of Christ, or else we're not saved. That's what religion will tell you. But Paul, though, he completely discards that. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, which we read earlier, he says concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Um, technically, the righteousness which is in God's law is the righteousness of God because Jesus Christ, he obeyed the law completely. He became the sacrifice of sins under the law. Galatians 3 says... Uh, quoting the law that's found in Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And so you had Jesus Christ hanging on a tree. He was became a curse under the law. Uh, Paul told the Corinthians he was made sin for us. In other words, he fulfilled the provision of death for sin under the law. The wages of sin is death. He fulfilled that provision for us as our substitute. And so then we receive the righteousness of God by faith, by believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins. That righteousness, though, is under the law. God would not be a just God if, or a righteous God if he did not obey the law. He has, you know, he has to go by what the law says as well, or else he'd be an unjust God. So Jesus Christ fulfilled the provisions in the, under the law, died for, our, died for our sins. He was made sin for us. So that since he took that sacrifice, he fulfilled the law's provisions, the righteousness which we receive is under the law. In fact, that's what Paul says over in the book of Romans. Uh, he says that when we believe in Jesus' death as atonement for our sins, we establish the law. We establish the law as valid, and it's under that provision. The death sacrifice of Jesus under the, on the cross was under that law system. So the righteousness that's under the Mosaic law is... God's righteousness because that's how God brings about salvation for us but the righteousness which is under the Jewish religion we've already read in Isaiah 64 is as filthy rags Jesus says if that's the righteousness you're trusting in you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven not a single one of those Pharisees regardless of how good they are in obeying that Jewish religion that law would ever make it into the kingdom of heaven if that's what they trusted in. So even though Paul here, he sets that great example as a Pharisee of the Pharisees who, who is blameless under that law, Paul recognizes that that law cannot save him. That righteousness that is under that law is as filthy rags. And so he makes the conclusion here in verse 7, Philippians 3 verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss, for Christ. Notice it's my own self-righteousness. It's under, uh, when I try to follow a religious system, that's a gain to me because it's something that I do out of my own physical effort in order to get into heaven. 
So that's gain to me, but he notices that that since it's as filthy rags, that he counts that gain as really loss for Christ, recognizing that it's much better to give that up because the gain that he's getting really is the lake of fire. That's what he's getting because his righteousness is as filthy rags. So the gain that he got is that lake of fire. So he gives up that, counts it as loss, all anything he did on his own, trust in Christ, and Christ's righteousness through the Mosaic law is going to give him eternal life. And so then he continues there, verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, meaning the loss of everything in the flesh that he's done. He suffered the loss of them, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Your next fill in the blank is because religion's righteousness is as filthy rags. Therefore, Paul counts his blameless record under religion as dung. He says that right there in verse 8. Do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And you get the analogy is dung is something that is not useful to your body. It's the waste. It's something that your body throws away. It cannot be used. You know, you get the new, you eat, you get the nutrients and everything, and it nourishes your body, and you keep going through what you eat. But then there are things in the food that is not needed by your body, and they just, they just go out. They're not used by the body. And that's Paul's point here, is that when it comes to things that you have in Christ, your eternal life, your sanctification after that, he says, all things I count for loss, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, by whom I have, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. If you come to Christ and you say, okay, well, I'm going to trust in your death as atonement for my sins, but first I need to join the church. I need to get water baptized. I need to turn from my sins. And you, whatever you do, invite Jesus into your heart. If you've got these list of things that you need to do in order for Christ's uh, cross, the, his death on the cross to count for your sins, according to these verses here, it's not going to work. He says that he has suffered the loss of all things. And as far as religion is concerned, Paul did not have a better... Paul had probably the best pedigree of anybody else. Born a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was circumcised. He was born a Jew, brought up in it. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, became a very uh, an expert in the law, and he was blameless under that system. If you want an example of somebody who was religiously right, that's Paul. And even in spite of all that, he doesn't even hang on to a little bit. He doesn't say, well, the good things I did, I'm going to keep. The bad things I did, I'm throwing away. He doesn't say that. He says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Just like you think of what you eat according to what Paul is saying here, if you make the analogy, spiritually speaking, Anything that religion has to offer apart from God's word, it's considered waste. It's useless. It's no good. It will not do anything to help you. So, so the problem is when man, we talked about salvation by faith alone last week, when man adds anything to it, even if it's somebody who is real good, the, the best, you know, been a member of a church for 50 years, been there every Sunday, uh, volunteer, be a leader in the church, doing all these great things, if they're just doing it as part of their own righteousness or through their own efforts, trying to be sanctified through their own efforts, Paul says here that those things are completely worthless. He's counted all, even though he was blameless under the religious system, he's counted all of them as loss for Christ. And the reason, while we're in Philippians chapter 3, you go down to verse 21 and you can see, as I put on your outline, the next point here is that your flesh is vile, which means it is no good. In spite of all the good things that you could do in your flesh, it's not really good. Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Paul is writing to save people. He's writing to the Philippian church. They have already trusted 
and the death, burial, and, and resurrection of Christ in order to be saved. So they have salvation.